Well, welcome to week four of the Classics Faculty Virtual Reception Seminar, which this term, as you've seen, has the theme Classical Literature and the Mind of Europe. Even in this tranquil sphere, uh, Europe means different things to different people, and some of those tensions are things that we're overtly addressing in this series, as we will be today in Constanza Gutenka's talk uh, on American Classicists, Old Europe, modern Greece. Now, in one sense, today's seminar is picking up a discussion from last week's by Mikhail Paschalis, where he looked at the distinctive place of modern Greece in how classical reception in Europe comes about. And of course, it points also to the fact that Europe is a concept influentially formed by Americans, such as T.S. Eliot, who gave us the series title, or of course, when we think of the world of uh, fiction writing and travel writing, Henry James. So it would be hard to imagine Europe without imagining it partly through and against the eyes of Americans. Well, the figure that today is going to be the subject of attention is of a rather different kind, very important. It's the classical scholar Basil L. Gildersleeve. He is a central figure in the formation of classical studies on the German model in the American Research University, an important scholar in his own right, but at the same time an uncomfortable figure to deal with in many ways. The author of The Creed of the Old South, um, a proud Confederate veteran, an unrepentant segregationist. We're going to be following his path from Charleston, South Carolina, all the way to Robert College, Istanbul, via Göttingen and Olympia. And we're going to be doing so with two very authoritative guides who are so well established in the classical reception field that I can only plug them rather than introduce them. Uh, our speaker, main speaker, Constanza Gutenka, um, who, like Emily Greenwood, is very conversant with the whole uh, modern Greek side of things, is, among other things, the author of Feeling in Classical Philology, Knowing Antiquity in German Scholarship, 1770 to 1920, monograph which appeared uh, with CUP earlier this year. And there she really looks at so many of the issues which are going to come up today through the Germanophile, Anglophobe figure of Gildersleeve. And in response, we're going to hear from Emily Greenwood, John M. Musser, Professor of Classics at Yale, but also affiliated to the African-American studies program there. And she is the author of, among other things, the OUP monograph Afro-Greeks, which won the uh, Ron Simon Award in 2011. And she's written much about um, subaltern classics, uh, importance of classics in the Black Atlantic, and so on. So we're in for a very interesting uh, paper and subsequent discussion looking at this complicated figure of Gildersleeve and seeing what that tells us about the classics and the mind of Europe. So straight over to Constanta Gutenka, Professor of Greek Literature at the University of Oxford, a fellow of Corpus. Off you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And thank you in particular also to Emily for doing this at such an early hour of the morning. Now, Basil Gildersleeve is probably the best known American classicist of the turn of the century, and by now also one of the most contentious. My aim here is certainly not to offer an apology for him, but rather to probe the tensions and paradoxes in which for all his rhetorical in which he operates for all his rhetorical flourishes and grandstanding. Gildersleeve's attitude is revealing about the situation of classics in an American context where the relationship with Europe could be articulated as both progressive and productive, as much as nostalgic and reluctant. Gildersleeve came from an established family in Charleston, South Carolina. After graduating from Princeton, which was in the North, but had a heavy Southern slant, he went to Germany where he studied with some of the big names of the time and received a doctorate from Göttingen in 1853. After some years in limbo, exploring a journalistic as much as an academic career, he became professor of Greek at the University of Virginia. He fought and was wounded in the Civil War, 
which he supported enthusiastically on the side of the Confederates. And in 1875, he accepted the newly founded chair of Greek at Johns Hopkins University, also the relatively newly founded Johns Hopkins University, where he set up a graduate seminar of German style and proportions. He was twice president of the American Philological Association and a founding editor of the American Journal of Philology. And he was, and maybe still is, best known for his scholarship on Pindar and on Greek and Latin syntax, training a large generation of classicists in the new German style. His case illustrates a moment when European scholarly methods and environments themselves assumed the role not of a stable center, but of an unsettling element in its own right. When imported European scholarly practices, both old and modern at the same time, became a pot potentiality as much as an irritant. These issues unfolded to an extent with Gildersleeve's own strong advocacy at a moment when classical knowledge underwent professionalization and institutionalization. In the US, it had historically been much less self-evident that the classical education embodied the golden road to social status and individual development. Already in the 18th century, rhetorical skills and classical learning could be a cause for suspicion as much as a source of admiration. The research university, which in America came into being in the late 19th century, together with a ready-made departmental structure, formed its institutional identity in strong interaction with an industrializing capitalist society, which willingly invested in higher education, but also created the need to justify <clears throat> non-utilitarian learning. At the same time, universities retained socially legitimating power for a rising entrepreneurial middle class. Classics as a guarantor of class, as in England, or of qualification, as in Germany, with its direct line from university to the teaching profession and the civil service, was from the beginning as much contested as it was embraced in the US. And so in many ways, the American constellation upends several of the cultural conditions about the centrality of classics to education and society, which we tend to take as our default from a European point of view. In Gildersleeve's world, classical knowledge was then prized as much as it aroused suspicion. Partly, this was a reflection of the complex relationship with old Europe. Classical learning continued to be an aspect of gentlemanly education, but it was also seen as symptomatic of the British system that, particularly in the South, enjoyed a highly ambivalent standing. An important aspect to bear in mind when it comes to evaluating the writings of Gildersleeve, who identified strongly with the Confederate South and its cultural and historical particularities. In Michael O'Brien's words, apropos the intellectual culture of the South when it encountered Europe, in Europe, Southerners were most torn between their identity as post-colonials who wished the Atlantic to be wide and their identity as migrant Europeans who wished for comedy with the old places. Now, German scholarship, especially in theology, was considered a force to be reckoned with in a good way. Much as also for any American student in Germany, the dangers of apostasy were always invoked. In other words, biblical scholarship was a model of modern scientific uh, scholarship, theological scholarship. On the other hand, there was all, always the danger that the rigorous philological taking apart of texts could lead to a loss of faith. <clears throat> At the same time, Germany promised a deflection from whatever it was that England or France stood for, an alternative to the old powers against which America had been defining itself, whether politically, socially, or intellectually. Still, to adapt to the restrictions and challenges of the new German scholarship was hard for those who came to study there. In Stephen Neumeyer's words, Germany was for Gildersleeve's generation, and that immediately preceding him, a source of both inspiration and despair. Germany provoked anxiety, and the strictures of a professionalizing discipline with strict new methodological protocols 
only added to those anxieties. When Gildersleeve returned to the US in 1853, waiting to find a job, he returned to plans for a novel he had made as he set sail three years earlier. And he drafted or at least made plans for two volumes, Schlafhausen, means sleepy town, a year in the life of Alfred Thistledown's life, and Schlafhausen, Confessions of a Very Young Man, a Bildungsroman in the tradition of Goethe's Wilhelm Meister, <clears throat> and Gildersleeve incidentally was a great admirer of Goethe, like many of his contemporaries. In Berlin, his work on the novel had stalled once he found himself more than busy trying to catch up with the requirements of lectures and of the new strictures of an institutionalized discipline, feeling like many of his American contemporaries in Germany, overwhelmed by the expectations of a new professionalizing frame. This experience of being de-skilled and of articulating both the normativity and the alienation, but only indirectly, <coughs> is reflected well in Gildersleeve's autobiographical texts and also in his useful novel, which, apropos its complex relationship with scholarship, he at some point considered subtitling a loose series of studies in six books. An extreme form of such displacement, which exoticizes and self-exoticizes, but never strays too far from keeping with social expectations, a displacement which describes alienation, but attempts to make it containable and acceptable, comes in a passage of the novel that describes an encounter of the young hero with the daughter of a professor whom he hopes to court. In this scene, the young American and the girl find themselves alone in the hallway of the professorial home. The narrator likens their image, they stand before a mirror looking at themselves, rather than at each other, to a popular engraving of Paul and Virginie, the two young lovers of a novel of the same name by the French naturalist Bernardin Saint-Pierre from 1788. This short novel was originally published as an appendix to a scholarly work, Saint-Pierre's three-volume Studies on Nature. It tells the Daphnis and Chloe-like tale of two children of white parents who grow up semi-orphaned on the island of Mauritius, far from the colonial center and surrounded by local nature and culture. The novel itself, as well as run-of-the-mill prints of scenes from the book, were very popular in mid-19th century French and German middle-class households. Still, it seems startling for the American abroad to fantasize himself, aspiring to a scholarly career, into such a particular exotic and self-colonizing setting of emotional and cultural estrangement. That this scene should follow straight from a conversation the young man has with his professor about recent articles in the German press on exotic American wildlife shows very well how difficult it is to pin down just who is the observer and who is the exotic object of observation. As Germany could in the American press be itself exoticized, and it often was, being an American in Germany meant being confronted with what amounted to a colonial gaze that could raise anxieties. No less than those that came with the expectation that American students, like their German peers, were to be cut no slack when it came to their philological preparation. Late in 1896, Basil Gildersleeve went on a trip to Greece, sponsored by the Atlantic Monthly magazine, to cover for the American public the first modern Olympic Games. While Gildersleeve was at the height of his career, the trip itself came after the event of the Olympic Games. They had happened with large American support already in April of that year. The belatedness of his reporting does not worry Gildersleeve overmuch, but issues of modernization and progress and belatedness appear with regularity as a theme throughout the piece. It was published in three installments in spring 1897 under the title My 60 Days in Greece, and it is, despite its general audience and Gildersleeve's journalistic experience and his willingness to write for just such an audience, in many ways also a meditation on the role and voice of the specialized scholar. In our time, he writes, equipped for sympathy as no other age has been in the long procession since the close of antique life, 
America is for him a place of true Philhellenism, not only because excavations have revealed to, to us everything as more vivid, but because Americans, like Greeks, he thinks, share not only an appreciation of victory, apropos the Olympic Games, but, quote, an intense love of country that is characteristic of the Greek nation that covers a multitude of deviations from European standards. So in other words, Americans and contemporary Greeks are by an order of magnitude more patriotic than their European counterparts. Put differently, quote, the true way to be interesting is to smack off the soil, to be Spartan, Treveran, American. While Gildersleeve tries to identify positive commonalities between contemporary Greece and America, their love of the soil, their groundedness, their agonistic spirit, he is, for all his journalistic jauntiness, ready to acknowledge the complicated relationship that both shared with old Europe. This sense of belatedness vis-a-vis -vis Europe is maybe most manifest in the long description of a visit he gives, um, a visit to the local lyceum the pride of the town of Sparta. So he's taken around by, uh, by local dignitaries on his trip through Greece. Uh, and in Sparta, he is shown the local high school as a center of modernizing learning. Here, he finds, quote, a room that was a facsimile of the one in which I myself had sat some 40 years before in Göttingen. <clears throat> school grammars constructed on the basis of Curtius, Meyer, and other German authorities whose content is nothing but German done into conventional modern Greek. As well as academic Greek journals summarizing German philological work and more up-to-date in this respect than American ones. And yet, and yet, while he professes great admiration for the standards of learning, new standards of learning already achieved, Greece's own form of modernization, Greece's engagement with them, a sign of progress, he also describes the emulation of the Germanic model with almost a note of disappointment about the extent and success of this progress. German learning, in short, can be too much of a good thing if it stands in the way of a more immediate encounter with antiquity. Earlier on, a highly technical lecture by his German archaeological guide, which he describes, had prompted in him quote, a perverse interest in the prickly pears, which were just then full of blooms and pushing their purple and yellow flowers from the edge of the barbed discs with an insulting opulence, like so many ficos to the universe. No one would expect such insolent, not to say indecent beauty of a plant that is all made up of greenness and prickles, a plant that might well serve to embody the popular conception of the philological guild. So here he he reflects on the prickliness um, of, the, of the typical dry philologist while he is distracted from an example of exactly this philological uh, technicality looking at the landscape around him. His philologist, therefore, is precariously positioned between disciplinary tedium and unexpected creative flourishes not unlike those of his own prose, which he contemplates side by side against the backdrop of the Greek landscape. So the philologist is both the prickly pear, but also the plant in bloom that distracts from the archaeological boredom. A little further on, Gildersleeve uses his institutional imagery carefully once more when he compares the open expansive site of Olympia to a great exposition, like the universal expositions that had been staged in America as well. But he compares the stern vertical location of Delphi to a great university, and he makes very clear his preferences. The life of earth and sky, the life of ancient Greece, and the life of modern Greece, one sees life whole, who sees it at Olympia. Uh, he here, I think, by the way, quotes Matthew Arnold, who had described Sophocles as someone who saw life steadily and saw it whole. Gildersleeve's last stop on his trip, though which he does not mention in the articles, was Constantinople. Here he was asked to give a speech to the graduating girls of Roberts College, the American Educational Foundation and High School. 
the dispatches to the American readers of the Atlantic Monthly were one thing. But for the girls of Roberts College, as Gildersleeve later admits to a correspondent, he recycled a lecture he had given two years earlier to the female students of Bryn Mawr, its title, The Spiritual Rights of Minute Research. Sixty Days exemplifies how unresolved the paradoxes are between allegiance to an admirable but also stale Germanic model and an insistence to surpass it in the name of unearthing a more unadulterated living approach of being both ancient and modern at the same time. The sight of this confluence, or rather the sight of being able to make sense of this tension, is contemporary Greece, a deliberate elsewhere that is for American scholarship both old Europe's past and America's new ally. Back in the States, we find in Gildersleeve's later writings an attempt to celebrate a new kind of ostensibly self-assured immediacy as an alternative to German science. In his essay, Classical Studies in America, from 1896, also published in the Atlantic Monthly, by the way, a lecture given at Yale for the inauguration of their own classics department, he describes his German years in the language of pilgrimage to the Holy Land, thus moving the imagination yet one step further east. A conceit, by the way, he was not alone to use, not least because of the close proximity of classical philology and biblical philology in American minds and the reputation that Germany and its institutions held in both. In the Yale speech, he declares that 46 years ago, I set out on my pilgrimage, turning my face toward what was then the promised land of the classical philologian, namely Germany. And he speaks of American neophytes and the devotion of American scholarship and the faith of Americans in German methods. He describes his lecture itself as first leaves and last leaves from the journal of the classical pilgrim on his voyage from America to Athens by way of Germany. <clears throat> this is not meant as a florid way of saying we understand antiquity better thanks to Germany. Instead, it is part of a larger program that aims for an ostensibly much greater affinity between America and Greece, including familiarity with its sites and materials. Germany, the Germany is in by way of Germany, then stands for a kind of liminal phase which one needs to pass through but also eventually supersede, whether personally or institutionally, or both. Gildersleeves achieves this in his essay and in others, in this essay and in others, by offering an account of the development of German scholarship that is as critical as it is nostalgic. He separates out one strand of a German ideal tradition of a vital, personal, vibrant approach to the study of antiquity, which he saw still available in his own student days, and he opposes it with the dry, heavy learnedness and failure of teachers to live up to their prophetic office, which now is dominant. In short, Gildersleeves suggests a translatio of what he considers the ideal of German Bildung from Germany moving to America by way of its more immediate, direct scholarly engagement with the world of antiquity in its full material and textual spectrum. So in other words, the idea of building that has gone stale in Germany is sort of revived in an American context. In the 1890s, American museums were taking off in a major way. The Archaeological Institute of America and the American School of Schools in Athens and Rome had recently been established, and a concerted effort was made to make a mark in this arena of scholarly production. What he calls a quest of the immediate vision and a new era of classical study in which to know Italy, to know Greece, is to be more and more the privilege of American scholars that Gildersleeve himself was only too glad to promote. In his essays of the late 1890s then, at the height of professional success, Gildersleeve speaks with enthusiasm of the emancipation of American classical learning that has been achieved in the new research university thanks to German models. Though we need to ask whether Gildersleeve, the Confederate cavalry officer from a slave-owning family, could ever speak unambiguously about emancipation, if not to his, then at the very least to our ears. 
if Germany was America's other, then Greece, with all its own southern stereotypes and its own complex forms of modernization and belatedness, was its further other and a site of shared new belated affinities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Constanza. So straight on to Emily Greenwood, our respondent. Hey, good morning, everyone. In 1892, Basil Gildersleeve published the essay, The Creed of the Old South, to which David referred in his introduction. This was a nostalgic essay on the culture and civilization of the antebellum South, Gildersleeve's preferred past. In the same year, 1892, Anna Julia Cooper published A Voice from the South, considered to be the first work of black feminist criticism in the US. Considering contemporary xenophobic anti-immigrant slogans, such as America for the Americans, Cooper imagines a call and response, asking who are Americans and saying that this question comes rolling back from 10 million throats. Who are the home folks and who are the strangers? Who are the absolute and original tenants in Fee Simple? To which Cooper responds that Native Americans have the rights of primogeniture. Yet in the same work, Cooper also employs this discourse rhetorically along a South-North axis, turning the figure of the foreigner against Americans in the Northern states, who she believes extend their concern for labor reform and the rights of women factory workers only so far as white women factory workers. For his part, Gildersleeve used various circumlocutions to foreignize his black countrymen and women, including the phrase sons and daughters of Africa in an editorial that he wrote for the Richmond Examiner on Christmas Day, 1863. And it's relevant to note, um, Gildersleeve was writing and using these circumlocutions between the Dred Scott decision of 1857 that denied the right of citizenship to um, people of African descent under the constitution and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which uh, acknowledged this right, although uh, not with any particular performative power. Gildersleeve was born in South Carolina in 1831 into a family that owned slaves for domestic service. Anna Julia Cooper was born Annie Julia Haywood in Raleigh in North Carolina in 1858 to Hannah Stanley Haywood, who was enslaved, and Haywood's owner, George Washington Haywood. I start with Cooper to highlight another aspect of the tensions and paradoxes that Constanza brought out so skillfully in her paper. Gildersleeve's trip to Greece and his subsequent travel writing come reportage in 1896 take place in the reconstruction period in America in the context of a deeply divided consciousness of what America was, is, and what it could be. And I'm trying hard, of course, to ignore awkward contemporary resonances here. As Constanza points out, Gildersleeve's Greece was in part a projection of the Old South, sometimes referred to as Southland in Gildersleeve's day, and vice versa. At a time where Gildersleeve has become part of the historical reckoning of the cultural and indeed the racial identity of the discipline of classics in the US, what I find so intriguing and new about Constanza's approach and framing is that the apparently stable point in Gildersleeve's identity, or what we've been treating as the apparently stable point, his self-formation as a classical scholar, which we use as a canvas on which to discern his racial imagination, turns out in Constanza's telling to yield its own rich, divided classical imagination. More than the cultural ambiguity of Gildersleeve's idea of an American tradition of classical scholarship, Constanza's paper also complicates the mode and sufficiency of scholarship. Constanza writes, to remind you, Gildersleeve's case lets us ask what happens when European scholarly methods and environments themselves assume the role not of a stable center, but of an unsettling element, when scholarly practices imported from the East, Europe, both old and modern at the same time, become a potentiality as much as an irritant. Gildersleeve's voyage out from America to Germany in 1949 took place, as Constanza has explained, 
in the concept of the incipient professionalization of university education in North America. But whereas Gildersleeve goes to Germany looking for and finding specialization, others of his contemporaries went to Germany to find a blueprint for professionalization, which they could then disaggregate from excessive specialization. An example would be Charles Eliot and his research trip to Europe in 1863 to study research universities in Germany and France, which would inform his famous vision of a new education, an essay that he published in 1869 in the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, and Eliot, of course, was to go on to become president of Harvard. I've been using the phrase, the voyage in, alluding to Edward Said's 1993 work, Cultural and Imperial, Culture and Imperialism, perhaps prompted by Constanza's quoting O'Brien, Michael O'Brien's description of Southerners in Europe, and I quote, torn between their identity as post-colonials and their identity as migrant Europeans. In chapter three of Culture and Imperialism, Said used the idea of the voyage in of intellectuals from colonial or peripheral regions traveling to Europe and challenging the geographical and cultural situatedness of knowledge there. And to quote Said, he describes these intellectuals setting themselves the revisionist critical task of dealing frontally with the metropolitan culture using the techniques and discourses of scholarship and criticism once reserved exclusively for the European. He continues, the voyage in then constitutes an especially interesting kind of hybrid cultural work and that it exists at all is a sign of adversarial internationalization in an age of continued imperial structures, end of quote. Parts of this could be applied to Gildersleeve's experience of the voyage into Germany, but the coordinates are of course off. We end up having to think of the modern discipline of classics not for the first time as a cultural imperial project with Germany as its metropolis and Gildersleeve as the volitional subject. But Gildersleeve's voyage in does not give rise to any oppositional culture and does not transform or trouble the vision that German classicists had of their discipline. Does the voyage in reveal for Gildersleeve the constructiveness of classicism in a cultural anthropological sense that brings home to him the constructiveness of his beloved Southern identity and the role of Greece in this construction. So Constanza wrote uh, very nicely, being an American in Germany meant being confronted with what amounted to a colonial gaze that could raise anxieties. Does the later trip to Greece then foster an even more romantic, sublime Hellenic ideal rooted in the land of Greece? In other words, does Greece offer a more usable version of the past than Germany? But as Constanza analyzed so compellingly in her 2008 book, Placing Modern Greece, the Dynamics of Romantic Hellenism, this fascination with Greece's materiality as a proxy for its ideality derives in large part from German culture, the culture beloved of Gildersleeve. So where exactly do we locate the translation zone for Gildersleeve? America, Germany, Greece, between the three, I end by returning to the juxtaposition between Gildersleeve and African-American thought with which I began. Constanza's analysis of Gildersleeve makes me think of a couple of sentences in Ralph Ellison's 1977 essay, The Little Man at Chihol Station. There Ellison remarks on, and I quote, the enigma of aesthetic communication in American democracy and the metamorphic character of the general American audience, with the unrecognized and unassimilated elements of its taste. Perhaps Ellison's omnicultural sense uh, might be applied to an omnicultural reading of Gildersleeve, in which classical and vernacular are blended in clear ways. And perhaps this is another strand, as Constanza has opened up for us, of Gildersleeve's classicizing imagination. Thank you.